welcome everyone to another webinar on the pay app series digitizing construction today we're going to discuss the future of construction collaboration how that relates to a now often used term the new normal and how the industry can take advantage of established and emerging technology to mitigate future risk and drive efficiency efficiency i'm neil cameron i'm the sales manager at pay apps and today it's my pleasure to introduce our panel members Doug Zuzik, CIO from Adco Constructions. Hi, Doug. Hi, Neil. Good day. And Ivan Fernandez, Senior Fellow and Industry Director for Frost and Sullivan. Hello, Ivan. Hi, Neil. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Today's agenda, we'll start with a presentation from Ivan on the future of construction collaboration. That will take us approximately 20 minutes, and we'll follow that by a short audience poll and then the panel discussion between Doug and Ivan. Um, we'll finish with audience questions and that should take us to the hour. Thanks, I. So uh, let's get going, Ivan. Um, over to you for an introduction and your presentation. Excellent, thanks, Neil. Um, just to give you a very quick um, um, brief intro about Frost & Sullivan. We are an industrial research and consulting firm, um, about 40 offices, most major markets, covering a range of sectors and technologies. Um, I'm based here in the Sydney office and we look after the Australian New Zealand region out of here. So when we talk of the future of construction, I think one of the things that's obviously front and center of most people today is the kind of risks that we are facing and COVID has sort of brought that really uh, back on the table in terms of the level of disruption that the construction industry faces. And for that matter, all industries, cities, governments, uh, the public. We did a study of the major risks over the long term, medium term, and the short term. And it's really interesting to actually look at the results from that. So in effect, what we are trying to say is that something like the, the COVID pandemic uh, or any other pandemic is just one of a number of risks that all of us have to contend with. You could be a government, you could be a, a, um, you could be a, a public sector entity, you could be a, a, an educational institution, you could be a contractor, you could be a customer, uh, you could be a startup, and you still got to contend with a huge range and diversity of risks. So uh, pandemics is just one of those. We all know, if you just take the examples out here, natural disasters, Australia's black summer bushfires that we just uh, experienced in 2019, 2020. We had, what, 3,500 homes destroyed, 34 fatalities, human fatalities, over 1 billion um, animals killed. We had, in fact, 21% of Australia's forest cover destroyed in that one bushfire season. And just to give you some perspective, so what we're talking of is globally, on average, a bushfire season will, will see something in the region of 4 to 5% of um, forest cover destroyed. We saw 21% of that destroyed in last summer's bushfires. So we're talking of very significant risks of massive scale. You take something like neo-nationalism, and then you're talking about the constrained, the, the, the kind of uh, strained uh, relationships that Australia now has with China and the implications that will have for all sectors in Australia. You talk of an economic slowdown and there are significant impacts on funding in terms of recruitment, in terms of cash flows. You talk about something like cyber risks and we're not talking of cyber risks uh, typically front and center of public uh, uh, view, but we're talking of enterprise uh, level cyber risks because what's happened with the whole uh, leverage of commercial off the shelf um, uh, systems in, in, in terms of IT within industrial environments is that now the attack surface has widened and the number of risks have widened. So cyber, cyber risks are quite significant from a construction perspective as well. The future of jobs, we all know that automation is one big uncertainty and the impact it's gonna have on the future of jobs, but also in a positive way, a risk like the future of jobs has a, has, has a silver lining to it in the sense that COVID, for example, has highlighted to us that the supply chain disruptions that we've faced uh, this last uh, half of the year cannot be let um, to sort of remain as such. 
And that sort of prompted a new type of thinking in terms of nearshoring of manufacturing, reshoring of manufacturing, and that's going to have a spillover effect in terms of jobs for local manufacturing in Australia. So yeah, overall, a lot of risks that are out there, but useful lens to apply in terms of looking at these risks is to move beyond the here and now kind of uh, challenges and opportunities you have and pause and sort of expand your view to something like a more big picture view. And that's why we at Frost & Sullivan call it the mega trends view. So basically we're saying that there are so many significant shifts happening to your, your customers and customers of your customers on a global basis transformative shifts that will change the way we live, the way we work, the way we define success. And some of these are going to have very direct impacts on the construction sector, whether it's connectivity and convergence, whether it's something like urbanization, whether it's something like um, the future of infrastructure development. All of these have a lot of macro to micro implications. And it's a useful exercise for us when we look at the future of our industry to actually look at what are those so what implications when we look at these large trends and how they impact the current opportunities, medium term opportunities and the long term opportunities. So why are we talking about construction collaboration? Many reasons and I'll go through a few of them. The first is obviously the fact that the very value chain of construction is being disrupted. So when I say value chain, we're talking of a sector that has done things a particular way for decades or even say almost centuries, you could say, with very little change in the, the kind of stakeholders involved. But because of those megatrends that we just spoke of, the very shifts that we spoke of in terms of collapsing of boundaries, the entry of new competitors, the new business models that are there, the disruption from digital, all of that has resulted in significant disruption to this value chain. So one example is obviously something like offsite construction. Of reducing your, your time delays, modular and prefab can deliver something like 30 to 50% quicker uh, completions. You're talking of lower risk of disruptions in terms of your projects because you have less um, uh, vulnerability in terms of exposure to weather variations and moisture variations. You're talking of uh, automation that will reduce the amount of manpower that you use. You're talking of reduction in waste to landfill, safer on-site construction. So a lot of benefits that something like uh, off-site construction will, will present to, to our sector. And in fact, our estimate says that by 2023, this market alone, just modular and prefab will reach something like $157 billion in value by 2023. Another example of disruption is uh, the whole innovate to zero mega trend, where we are trying to achieve zero waste, zero emissions, zero defects. And that's approached by looking at circular principles, circular economy principles. That could be circular economy principles that you apply at the design phase. It could even be circular use. Now, when I say circular use, a good example will be your building material suppliers might move from a simple sell and invoice approach to a new kind of thinking, which is sell and buy back. So once you've got some unused material, they buy it back. Once you've used material that's reached its end of life, they buy it back, renovate, refurb, and recycle it back into the system, creating a circular economy loop. So that's another disruption that's happening within the sector. And uh, a, a number of other uh, factors that will disrupt the, the value chain as we know it. One thing that's changed, obviously, which is driving the demand for collaboration is the fact that projects are simply becoming more complex. Uh, we've, we've seen in Australia the huge uh, series of mega projects that we've had in road and rail and uh, infrastructure over the recent past and how that's expanded not only the scope of projects, but also the number of stakeholders involved in delivering those projects, as well as the timelines. And once all of these things expand, the, the risks of blowouts and costs, the risks of, of poorer outcomes increases. That's why it's really important to be able to have a collaboration tool that actually provides real-time, dynamic, updated, reliable, accurate insights on where we are at 
with each of these projects. Offsite construction I spoke about, green buildings. We know now 40% of Australia's office uh, stock is now green star certified. And Frost and Sullivan B-Track, a number of the technologies and solutions that are actually enabling green buildings. That could be everything from say, building integrated uh, photovoltaic, uh, your solar panels through to uh, smart HVAC, through to building energy management systems, redesigned building envelopes and uh, insulation. So a lot of enablers that are changing the way buildings are being uh, constructed in a more sustainable manner. Consolidation of contractors, that's something we're seeing on a global basis that uh, in the search for economies of scale and a, a wider footprint, we are finding that contractors are getting bigger because of acquisitions and alliances. And that means your need is not just to compare metrics in one particular project, but more often than not, it is now benchmarking against other projects in the city, other projects in the state, other projects in the country, or even globally. Increased compliance and reporting, that's again adding in another layer of complexity to construction projects, simply because the sector itself obviously needs to improve its, its track record in terms of workplace health and safety. But we've also seen in the more recent uh, past, we've seen this whole issue around building defects and how that's triggering increased oversight from governments and regulatory bodies. And once that happens, the onus is on the industry to increase the level of uh, track and trace, auditing, reporting, and, and uh, compliance uh, obligations. Finally, construction disputes. I think that's something that uh, we know because of the very fragmented nature of the whole construction ecosystem, that you're going to have different people with different types of agendas on any particular project. And that can often result in what we call a trust deficit. That means you're going to have a lot of disputes that need to be resolved at different times. That's another very important pain point that an effective collaboration tool can help address by providing track and trace end to end in real time. The other important challenge which collaboration solutions can help with in some way is obviously cost pressures. We've seen that the, 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 the fact that a number of projects, very high profile projects have gone over budget over time it is something that's quite concerning for all project stakeholders. And the, the fact that there are so many layers of uh, oversight, whether it's regulatory oversight, sa safety requirements and changes that have to be made, increases the challenge of keeping projects within budget and on time. And that's why something like consistent data workflows that actually are shared in a seamless manner between stakeholders internally and outside is gonna be extremely critical moving forward. We know that the Australian construction sector has experienced for five consecutive years of decline in productivity. That's a sector-wide challenge that must be met. A number of other sectors have done it. It's time that the construction sector has actually stood up to say that it, it is an issue that needs to be tackled and there are different reasons for it. One of the areas that we can obviously try and plug the gap is obviously in the level of real-time sharing of information that can prevent rework, delays, and uh, cost overruns. So again, an issue that's sort of triggering this thinking towards increased collaboration. On the flip side, what are the barriers to collaboration? So obviously we know that uh, when we looked at 2019, the residential construction sector weakness did obviously have a bit of a, a overall weakening impact on the total construction activity. And now with COVID, there are many niches and segments within the construction sector that aren't going to be uh, pushing through many of their projects. So that's going to obviously have a flow on effect in terms of the willingness of con contractors and construction firms to spend on uh, digital tools. But having said that, it's very often in a crisis like this, when your margins are under pressure and when your project pipeline is, is in trouble, that the need to, to leverage productivity tools is, is felt more keenly. And that's why this is in fact, what I would call both a, a driver and a restraint within this context. 
Inertia, that's obviously something that uh, construction professionals have uh, acknowledged that this, this, this issue of senior management not buying into the very need for digital transformation in many cases, still uh, practices that focus on using paper uh, processes, paper-based processes, and maybe even some general software, a very conservative mindset. And sometimes the very fact that our teams are very siloed and already quite watertight and that prevents the benefits of collaboration from being realized on an enterprise-wide basis. That's again an issue. Suboptimal outcomes. Now that's really an issue, not simply from a construction firm's point of view, but sometimes there are also vendors out there who promise a lot with devices and, and solutions and, and patches and apps and very often those outcomes aren't met. So it could be an issue of not having done enough of due diligence in terms of what solutions you're looking at. It could be the fact that the, the very solution proposed was not fit for purpose. It could be just that the technology vendor did not understand the real problem that was trying to be addressed. Whatever it is, it's definitely an area that has created an increased reluctance amongst some construction professionals when discussing digital transformation projects. So when we talk about the technology solutions, uh, vendors out there who can address some of these problems that we've uh, um, highlighted in terms of uh, collaboration and outcomes, one of the things that's important to do is to try and map out the different technologies that are likely to disrupt and impact construction. So we at Frost & Sullivan do that on a regular basis. And for the Australian market, we did this quite recently with the study that we just were working on and uh, mapped out in terms of impact, uh, mm -hmm. both by extent and timing of impact, what's really likely to create changes in terms of the way construction delivers outcomes in Australia. And as you can see here, cloud computing and mobile solutions are topmost in terms of extent of impact currently. Of course, we will also see a lot of uh, other digital solutions like five-dimensional BIM that will overlay time and cost data onto 3D BIM. You'll also have big data, you'll have AR, VR, a lot of other solutions that will gain traction over the long term. But what is, is important to realize is that when we talk of the future of construction, it's not about any one technology in isolation. It's really about overlaying different technologies and solutions and achieving those sweet spots, achieving those synergies that are not achievable if you actually just went with uh, single solutions that didn't really talk to each other. We spoke about cloud and how that's really most uh, relevant from an, uh, for a short-term perspective in terms of the digital transformation journey for construction. That's simply because there are so many compelling benefits when we talk about leveraging cloud solutions. Uh, there's pay as you go and which means that the construction firm does not really have to look at upfront costs uh, for infrastructure that may not be used all the time, may not be um, applicable all the time. Automated and streamlined work processes, collaboration across diverse data sets, multiple projects without overlapping the workflows, an audit trail. We spoke about uh, dispute resolution earlier, so that's also important. The fact that cloud providers have already invested in up-to-date security features, which you wouldn't have to do if you had to sort of do an on-premises solution. And then the fact that scalability and upgrades are built into the subscription model. And finally, obviously the importance about in-house resources and how the, the, the leverage of cloud solutions can help optimize your in-house IT stuff uh, within your firm. Some of the key solution features that Frost & Sullivan has seen um, that most construction uh, firms are looking for when they are talking of collaboration solutions. Web-based solutions, obviously, open API is very important simply because you want it to be able to integrate with other uh, platforms that you have working, BIM capability, uh, data integrity, quite often that's very really important. And uh, all, all the analytics and reporting capabilities that ensure actionable insights rather than adding just another overlay of data. 
Finally, in terms of vendors, there are quite a few different vendors out there in terms of construction collaboration solutions and construction uh, digital solutions for various use cases. And the number of use cases are increasing as we speak. But how do you differentiate one vendor from the next? Our research shows that the first most important criteria to look at is obviously the core application capabilities itself. What can it do? How does it perform? Uh, what's the reliability? What's the kind of um, efficacy of the solution? But very important and something that's not often uh, thought through quite well is the importance that needs to be placed on track record of a technology vendor within the construction industry. And when we say track record, we are saying, ask the questions around, what are your reference sites where you've deployed the solution in the construction sector? Can I speak to peers from other contractor firms who have actually leveraged your solution in the past? What is the industry level domain expertise your sales team has so that you can actually understand the problem I face on a construction site? Finally, the whole reason for asking these questions is to be able to sort of identify tech vendors who are able to partner with the construction industry on a long-term basis, simply because that's the best critical success factor to achieve digital transformation outcomes for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, and I'm sure our audience would agree that was, a, that was a very insightful and informative presentation, so thank you very much indeed. We are starting to get some questions coming through on the Q&A, um, so we'll keep those for the end and we'll address them after the end of the panel session. Right now we've got an audience poll and you can see that in front of your screens. Um, if you could all take the time to answer that, it's one question only, and then we'll move on to the, uh, to the panel discussion. Okay, so we can see the uh, poll results. And um, just looking at the information in front of me, what is the opportunity you see through the use of technology platforms? Um, improved time efficiencies, 25%, and improved productivity, 25%. So efficiency and productivity are the two main things that our audience uh, see as the biggest opportunity through technology platforms. Okay, thanks for that, everybody. Moving on to our panel discussion. Doug, let's get going. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself for those on the webinar who perhaps don't know who you are? Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, my name's Doug Zuzik. I'm the um, CIO at, at ADCO Constructions. Um, I've been in the industry for, for 15 years, working in, um, in the capacity of, 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 of IT and, 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 and in the construction industry. And as for ADCO, we're a, um, an Australian-owned construction business. Uh, we have uh, six offices across four states. And ADCO's been operating for almost 50 years um, and delivered over 3,500 projects. Um, we have over, over 500 employees and we operate anywhere from 40 to 50 concurrent projects at any one time. And just some of the projects, um, Neil, just so you know, that, that, that ADCO do are, uh, we do a lot of retail projects, um, shopping centres and the like, um, schools, a lot of primary schools, high schools, uh, leisure and aquatic, uh, recreation, community, hotels, um, defence. Uh, we're getting to a lot of defence projects at the moment and, and industrial. So all, so all types of sectors. Um, uh, in the past eight months, um, we've probably seen um, a, a lot of changes, I think, just in, in, in relation to um, um, the challenges probably just with, with, with COVID. And I'm sure you'll touch on that, that, that a bit later now. Yeah, I think that's, that's the first question I've got for you, Doug, um, is how has ADCO fared over the last eight months since the situation has arised? Um, mm. How has the use of technology helped you to mitigate and navigate some of the challenges that have come up? Yeah. So it's probably, um, the biggest one's probably been around procurement, uh, particularly with overseas procurement, supply chain and impacts on supply chain. 
Uh, definitely with, with, with project um, site standards and, and, and regulations that have been put, put in place. Um, things around the social distancing requirements, um, new signage requirements that need to be print up and, and, and put up on site. Um, obviously the COVID testing, particularly in Victoria, um, um, sanitation um, uh, requirements, as well as the requirement to, to quarantine workers. So we probably haven't had the numbers there that, that, that we had previously. Um, and not to mention the, the additional restrictions that, that, that are in place in Victoria. Um, and, and, and on top of all that, we've also got the, the, the challenges around the mental health and wellbeing of workers, which, which is that we've obviously had to step up our game in, in, in that place. Mm -hmm. um, a big change has been um, the increased number of employees that, that have been working from home. Um, ADCO has always supported um, work from home for, for our employees where, where possible. Um, but through COVID, we, we, we saw a, a rapid increase, and and um, and with that, we saw an increase in things like video conferencing and and, and with Zoom and Teams and so forth. Um, and we needed that requirement for for our employees to be able to work from from anywhere. Um, but that said, from an operational perspective, uh, we were relatively seamless, um, and the reason for that is is due to the software as a service, our, our cloud first approach. And I guess over the last couple of years, we've had a big push uh, to transition a lot of our on-prem um, applications into the cloud. And we've been transitioning to, to a lot of digital workflows as well as rolling out. Um, we've rolled out a lot of uh, notebooks to all our employees, so making sure they're on up-to-date hardware and, 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 and not impacted through, through um, degraded performance. But also things like tablets we've now issued through, through to our site teams as well to be able to operate and we've established a stand operating um, environment. So yeah, a few changes and challenges, but that said, I think the last couple of years, we've had a big focus on that, that, that push to cloud, um, enabling our project teams to sort of be, better be able to cl better collaborate. Uh, we've had a lot of new implementations which have supported that. Um, and as you know, and, and I've touched on earlier, is just the nature of construction, it requires a lot of, of interactions with with different trade partners, subcontractors, and consultants, and clients, and architects, um, and 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 and, and as a, without those collaboration tools in place, it would just be too inefficient, and 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 um, and, and opens itself up to to, to 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 risks and delays and so forth. Thanks, Doug. It certainly sounds like your cloud-first approach has has really has really helped and, and paid dividends for you um, in this time period. Um, could you give me an overview of the tech you're using at Adco? Um, uh, the, your approach to tech adoption and the, the digital mindset that you've talked about and um, why you selected the, the platforms that you have? Yep. So we've, um, we're, we've always been a, uh, we've looked at it as being a best of breed type approach. So best fit for the process or, or the outcome we're looking to achieve. Whether that's RFIs or EOTs or claims or defects, we're looking at what is the best outcome we're trying to achieve and we're looking at a best of breed type approach. Um, so that said, I think, and, and, and with a cloud first approach and, and, and more focus on the, the SaaS based environment, um, we had a lot of infrastructure. I think as, as we're a, um, a 50 year old business, we had a lot of um, um, add-ons and, and, and as we're opening up new offices and new project sites, we had a lot of legacy type servers which, which were in place. So. We decommissioned 50 servers. So we used to have servers on site. We used to have distributed file services. Um, we had a lot of storage. We had a lot of resources internally, you know, maintaining all, all, all of this infrastructure. Um, so one of the biggest changes for us was, was, was decommissioning over, over 50 servers. Um, we've got six left. And our goal is to, to be completely serverless by, by, by next year. So uh, that's a big change for us. Um, but what that's opened up is, is, is it's enabled a lot of capacity with, with, with resourcing within our team to be able to be more project focused and be more focused on proactive initiatives as opposed to just sort of being back a house and, and, and focus on the server administration. It's, it's, and that's enabled that capability to deliver more initiatives throughout the business. Um, and that's been, that's been, a, a, that's been a, a huge step forward for, for us. As well as that, we, we rolled out a, a national um, a Cisco software defined network across all our job sites and offices. Um, and this being 
critically uh, important for us, particularly with the increased dependence of, of, of applications that we're now dependent on. These are now business critical applications that, that we're dependent on for, for workflows and approvals. So it's really important for us, particularly from an applications point of view, obviously a video and video conferencing and, and, and phones, which are now dependencies from our side. Uh, in terms of the technology, we're, we've aligned ourselves heavily with Microsoft. So we are using SharePoint. Um, we do have um, uh, an in-house developer and we do have external developers that have helped us work with, with Power Apps and Power Automate. Um, we are in the Azure stack. Um, we're using a lot of SQL and um, Power BI is what we're starting to use now across our dashboard and analytics and, and lead-based KPI type reporting. Um, Dynamics, where we're using things like Yammer and Office 365. And we've also engaged with, with other vendors such as Oracle, Autodesk, Estimate One, Hammertech, PayApps. Obviously, it's been a great introduction for us and um, things like JobPack and, Job and, and Dropbox, just to mention a few. Thanks. Great, thank you, Doug. Uh, really good answer, really appreciate that. Uh, a question for Ivan now. Um, the presentation focused on collaboration tools, Ivan. Um, how important is it for these tools to play together nicely within an organization's um, existing tech ecosystem? Yeah, that's, that's really important because what's the end game? The end game is to realize enterprise-wide benefits. It's not about solving a niche problem with just a niche role or a department alone. So that's why integration and interoperability are going to be critical. So if the systems don't talk to each other, we are really missing out on opportunities to complete the big picture and actually improve the quality of decision making. So, so you're right, it, it, it is critical. Thank you, Ivan. Um, and back over to Doug. What are some of the traditional processes that you have been able to automate or digitize at Adco? Uh, so for us, it was more. It was it was always about how do we make it easier for our project teams? How do we make it? How do we make their lives easier and sort of remove any burden or, or, or admin heavy processes? Or looking, I guess, looking for outcomes in terms of how can we make um, 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 improve efficiencies in terms of on site. So some of the processes that that that, that um, um, we've looked at is site diaries. You know, from, from um, a field capture perspective. Um, Site diaries was an important one, particularly for our site managers and 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 um, um, another one was around the incident reporting, um, uh, safe safe work method statements, um, auditing, uh, project reporting, um, procurement. Um, pipeline and tendering, um, trade partner agreements and, 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 and PSAs, so getting, getting those signed electronically. Um, uh, site audits, design management, payment claims. Okay, great. Um, so just following on from that question, um, what are some of the benefits that you've achieved using, using some of those tools? Um, if you could perhaps expand on that for me a little bit. Uh, in regards to, to, I guess, pay apps, it's probably been more around the, the efficiencies to reduce some of the, um, the heavy admin paperwork requirements to process our claims and, 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 and also around that whole compliance information piece. Um, it's been important for us, for our trade partners in particular, to, to, to give them an intuitive and, and simple, a mobile interface for our trade partners to submit claims and, 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 and provide some transparency um, around the contracts and variations. Um, some of the other benefits, I think traditionally in the past, we've always had multiple systems. So when we're dealing with, with, with uh, uh, subcontractors, or we, we, we found that we had two systems and we had to reconcile. Um, so our, our subcontractors might have been using Myob or Xero or QuickBooks. They've submitted through a claim. And if we're using JobPack, then we need to use Excel to reconcile, which became really admin heavy. Um, so with that became a lot of duplication, a lot of rekeying um, and potential for mistakes. Uh, when we're dealing with, with a lot of different organisations across a lot of different locations in Australia, having all of that information on one platform, being able to, to reconcile it is so important for us, particularly with complying against um, regulations such as um, security of payments. Oh, yeah. um, 
as our business continues to use data and, and, and for us to scale and achieve efficiencies through, through less duplication and consolidated reporting, um, we need to create consistency across our jobs, uh, not to mention it helps with, with, with training and onboarding and compliance and so forth. Um, in our business, we've rolled out 20 new projects in the past two years, and that's seen a huge cultural shift, particularly when, when IT wasn't a focus in the past and it wasn't for such a long time. Um, now we have a lot of processes that are, that, that, that are online approvals instead of paperwork. And I guess just an offset from that, particularly on the sustainability side, has been our um, reduction in print volumes, uh, which are down 30% than where they were, were um, 12 months ago, uh, which is saving 100, 110,000 pages per month. And that's just through that transition to a lot of these digital workflows and, 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 and getting away from the paper. So we found that being a really good metric as, we, as we're starting to move those processes to, to digital. Okay, thanks, Doug. And um, now back over to you, Ivan. Um, looking at the barriers mentioned, uh, for example, construction is typically quite conservative and you know, we can have a, an attitude of, this is how we've always done it. Um, how can technology be championed internally to prove it's worth investing in? Yeah, no, very good question. Really, it's something that a lot of people are asking. But uh, the the way Frost and Sullivan looks at uh, industries actually helps because we just don't track the construction sector, but a range of other industries. So one of the things that we always tell our clients who start on a digital transformation journey is do not limit your scan to your own industry. But look at how peers in other industries are solving similar problems. So. For example, there might be um, a CIO or a CTO within a healthcare company or a defense organization or somebody in the automotive sector or the energy sector or food or any of the other sectors who are trying to solve some similar problems using digital tools. So very often just by widening the horizon beyond the immediate sector, you tend to get a little bit of the inspiration and out of the box thinking that is required to actually create some momentum within a digital transformation journey. So for example, in, in Australia, we know that there's a lot to be gained from the construction sector, looking at how the mining sector is solving some problems using digital tools, or even some of the power and water sector players are doing it. So that's what I recommend as a first step to actually widen the horizon and not just look internally that way it's easier to sort of um, um, outline your business case. The second thing is really about the business case itself. We aren't talking of creating one size fits all kind of a business case for any digital transformation project. Because the definition of success for each role in a construction firm is so different. Each has a different agenda and different KPIs. So the trick is to understand that and then propose different value propositions that address different definitions of success. That's the second thing. And the third, really very important, is to look for adjacencies. You might have a digital solution that's actually addressing one problem, but it can also alleviate another problem as an adjacency. And that's exactly what Doug mentioned when he spoke about the uh, savings in terms of printing and, and paper used. That's an adjacency that comes when you solve a core problem. The more adjacencies you identify, the better and more compelling the case to shift and transform. Thank you, Ivan, great answer. Uh, and I have a question for both of you. So we seem to slowly be coming out the other side of this pandemic and the restrictions slowly seem to be starting to ease, certainly in Victoria. Um, how can construction firms Start to use technology now to get up and running a bit faster. Perhaps you could go uh, first. Uh, for, for me, I think um, COVID should be a prompt for change. I think um, um, if businesses weren't prepared for, for and, and, and had digital workflows in place uh, before COVID, I think they would have felt that, 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 um, that, and th that, that disruption, um, particularly when their employees are working from home and, and, and their supply chain are working from home. So if anything, I think it should be a prompt for change. And I think I haven't touched on it before about the whole drivers and, and, and what, what, what pushes us to, to actually implement these solutions and implement these changes. I think 
if, if anything, um, COVID should be a prompt to, to, to do that. Um, but that said, I think it, it, it all comes back to the process. And I think that it's, for it to be successful, I think we need to focus on, on what the focus, fo uh, on, on what we're trying to achieve. And it's got to be, are we looking at uh, defects? Are we looking at claims? Are we looking at ITPs? Are we looking at, we've got to look at something, a process in the business is very repetitive where we can pick up some real um, um, efficiencies or, or remove um, a, 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 any, um, a, a, any frustration. And I think the change, it needs to communicate about the old way and the new way, um, as opposed to rolling out, you know, some new application name. And, and from that, I think there'll be, there'll be two, two, two gains, two, two primary gains that we see. And the first one, there's always that efficiency gain around the whole time saving, cost saving piece. Um, and, and the second one, which we're starting to really see now is, is around that whole, um, uh, the ability to capture data and report on data and report on trends. And, and that's where we're starting to consolidate and we're starting to look at, um, um, the dashboard reporting and analytics piece. Yeah, Thanks. that Doug, that sort of um, underlines exactly what I had as a response. That beyond the obvious operational benefits that everybody's uh, realizing by leveraging conferencing solutions and and collaboration tools when you have work from home and lockdown restrictions. Um, beyond the immediate productivity benefits and the reductions in costs and tracking and reporting that we said um, a lot of firms are achieving by leveraging digital tools. I think one of the things that uh, is, is critical is that what is front of mind right now is really future-proofing. The kind of disruption we have seen with COVID means that every technology that can help firms respond to disruption is going to be reviewed seriously. So for example, as a construction firm, can I identify digital tools that will help me analyze past causes of delays? How can I link that to my data on subcontractors I'm using, on the workflows that were related to those delays? And how can I analyze that, as Doug said, to analyze the data itself to help minimize poor outcomes in terms of uh, disruption. Thank you, Ivan. Um, another question for both of you. Um, some companies still have concerns around security and data, um, especially that's hosted in the cloud. What are some of the ways that we can address these concerns um, moving forward? I, I think that's a big one. I think if, as we transition from, from your, your in, into digital processes, we're going to start building dependencies, and um, what we notice is definitely security is 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 a, is a, is a huge one that, that we're seeing um, 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 uh, something that we're having to sort of um, constantly look at solutions to mitigate and control and, and 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 better manage. There's some other things as well, things like data services. You know, in terms of what data services we're now provisioning to our sites to make sure they've got adequate bandwidth to support these workflows that we're now putting onto them. Um, hardware performance as well. So whatever equipment we're sending out to, to our employees, making sure that, it, that, that, that they're not going to be interrupted with, with, with performance issues. And, and the other one around the responsive to support increase. But just to your question around the security, um, um, I think there's the fundamentals, you know, from an in-house network perspective, such as multi-factor authentication is big now. Um, firewalls and backups have always been there. But as we sort of start to adopt cloud software as a service vendors, uh, we need to be asking more, 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 more questions around accreditation. Um, so we need to start putting that, 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 that focus onto, onto our vendors and ask good questions around what security frameworks do they have in place? What are they accredited for? Um, the other ones around the whole data sovereignty piece in terms of where's that data housed? Is it housed um, locally, domestically? Um, and, and, and are there any replications going anywhere else? There's a whole um, backup and disaster recovery plans so now that is moving um, from internally uh, to our vendors, we need to be asking the question in terms of what, what, what is their backup process? Um, what are the disaster recovery plans? Um, and, 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 and where is that data being replicated? Uh, service level agreements as well. And, and, and um, in terms of what are the uptimes? So what are the uptimes that we, we expect as a client? And, 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 and so from a security point of view, I think there's a big shift now that that, that has been pushed to, from, from us to, to, to the vendors. Um, and, and they're the type of questions that we need to be asking. Yeah, yeah. and uh, just to add on to that, um, uh, Neil, um, it's important that we remember that uh, it's not just about cloud as a security issue, because 
we all know that when you talk about cybersecurity, you're, you're as weak as your weakest link. So it could be the cloud, which you obviously have to, um, to um, investigate in terms of the solutions and how robust the security is around the cloud solutions you use. But it could equally be something to do with your network, to do with your endpoints. It could be, uh, when we talk of endpoints, there could be N number of IoT devices that are out there uh, for your project. It could be mobile phones as endpoints. It could be your laptops as endpoints, thumb drives. It could be even the applications you use, the content you have. And then of course, the people and processes. I think that's really important in terms of looking at risks and uh, the implications in terms of cybersecurity. So it's not just about the cloud, but Talking about the cloud, and I think uh, Doug has uh, quite clearly answered that, uh, that concern. Fortunately for, for all of us today, there are a number of integrated cybersecurity solutions, not only for on-premises systems, but also for the cloud. And confidence in, in security within the cloud is actually reaffirmed when you look at how well it's been taken up by the government and public sector, who typically have a very high priority placed in terms of the security of data and systems. So in effect, what we're saying is the data that you actually save in, in a reputable cloud service provider is most likely to be safer than the information you store on your own computer hard drive because the servers they use are usually located in warehouses that are not accessible to, to any, anybody and everybody. The files they store on, or which, which actually have been stored on cloud servers are encrypted. So that means they're scrambled, which makes it harder for cyber criminals to access it. Um, most of your cloud vendors today who offer solutions have built in consistent security updates, AI tools and auto patching. They've got built in firewalls, redundancy, backup, as, as Doug mentioned again. So yeah, certainly for us today, the industry has moved on to almost like a very built in approach to cybersecurity rather than just a, a good afterthought. Thanks, Doug and Ivan, for, for both of your thoughtful and detailed questions. I really appreciate it. Changing the topic now and keeping the focus on you, Ivan, um, thinking about the market, um, that's probably quite a straightforward question, but are you seeing a, a rise in the number of solutions that are now available to, to firms? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think one of the great uh, success stories of digital transformation across every industry that we track is the fact that it's a much more level playing field. You can actually have a very innovative startup who's competing against the giants of this, of this world, uh, your, your Amazons and Googles and uh, Microsofts of this world. So it's really created a lot more visibility uh, in terms of innovation that's coming out of labs, out of uh, universities, out of uh, commercialized um, uh, programs from universities. So one of the areas where we are seeing it uh, particularly is in the Internet of Things, obviously. And um, that could be an Internet of Things, IoT sensors and devices and software applications. We are seeing a huge surge in the number of uh, firms vendors offering solutions for the construction sector and for the whole infrastructure sector itself. But that's why it's really important for contractors and construction firms to do their due diligence because you really have to cut through the clutter and identify vendors who you can truly partner with, uh, who not only have reliable, flexible, scalable uh, intelligent solutions, but also have the level of support that can help you to actually internalize the benefits uh, at your end. So there's a lot that's out there, but due diligence is required. Thanks again, Ivan. A question now for both of you, and we're coming towards the end of our questions and then we're going to the audience Q&A. Um, for both, key tips for construction firms to, use, to enable longevity and to remain competitive. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest tips was around the uh, not underestimating the impacts that um, a new digital solution can have on our supply chain. I think um, for us, we're a business of 500. We have 500 employees. And when we roll out a new solution, um, we need to realise that, that 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 solution is impacting our, our supply chain, our subcontractors, particularly if it's something that 
Uh, payoff is a good example um, um, where, 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 for instance, our, our supply chain is, it will, will be utilising the same system as what we do. So from a change management point of view, from, from an onboarding point of view, um, focusing on the processes, I think, is, is, is a big one for, for, for me. Um, and being clear on the benefit and the value for the employees and trade partners. And I think a lot of these innovations and startups, there's a lot of um, 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 just not doing it for the sake of it. I think it's just looking at what, what, what's the problem we're trying to address, what's the outcome we're trying to achieve. Um, developing a roadmap and, and just having a bit of a plan in terms of um, um, what our objectives are and, and, and putting in a fixed period has been really helpful, particularly getting alignment and, 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 and keeping on the same page in terms of what we're trying to, to deliver. Um, and just establishing some principles or, or, or pre-qualifications from, from our vendors um, around APIs are, are something that we utilise very heavily here at ADCO. Um, security, support, um, and, and it's an obvious one, but just listening. I think just listening to, to, to our employees, our, our going out to site and just listening to, to, to our trade partners and just understanding what are the frustrations and, and um, we also find the good ideas come from 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 others. Um, so I think just that 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 listening piece is is, is can't be underestimated. Um, and probably the last one is just that need for support throughout the business. I think the um, these type of things can't be gone at, at, at alone. It's 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 always a team effort, and and um, um, it's it's you've got to sort of um, whatever the whatever we're trying to deliver, it's got to be a a one in all in approach and. Um, and, and the, probably the, the, the key points for me there. Uh, yeah. Neil. Yeah, Doug, in fact, I think Doug sort of covered it all, uh, virtually all of the key uh, uh, things to keep in mind in terms of leverage of technology to remain competitive. I just maybe add to that to say that um, it's uh, one thing we found is it's when we talk about technology and technology transformation, the most important thing is not about technology. As Doug said, it's really about the people. So we're saying, our belief is that every company, to be honest, is a technology company. You might be an architect, you might be a, a subcontractor, you might be a designer, you might be a financier, but we are all digital companies simply because of the mega trend of connectivity, convergence and digital transformation that's made all of us leverage digital for benefit. That means digital is basic infrastructure that gets you a seat at the table. Once that understanding permeates the organization, then so many of these issues that come around uh, when you are embarking on a transformation project can be resolved much easier. Thanks, Simon, and, and thanks, Doug. Thanks both again for your thoughtful and detailed answers to, to our questions. Um, I do have some questions coming through from, from the audience now. Um, first one I'd like to, to put to you, Doug, is how has the impact of COVID affected your approach to employee health and well-being? Um, that's a good question. It's um, like I was saying before, we've always supported working from from home. Um, Adco have a lot of um, um, support programs that we have in place, um, things like um, Mend, um, and we also have you know, support packs that would sort of send out to 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 um, um, to the homes of, of, of our employees, um, to sort of let them know that, 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 that we're here. And probably the other one as well is just that whole connection piece. I think um, an, an example on, on that point is around um, um, in Victoria, I know that they have regular um, um, meetups and it's basically just, a, it might be some sort of trivia piece or it might be some sort of, just to sort of keep people connected. And I think that from the whole health and wellbeing piece, I think it's um, that connection piece, which is really being missed from a, from a, whether it's a social side or, or, or um, just being in isolation for so long is where you sort of, where, where, where that suffering's happening from a health and wellbeing point of view. So yeah, to answer that one, Neil, exactly. MEND is, 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 is a partner that we provide um, and a service we provide to all our employees. Um, as well as that, we've sort of got care packs that go out uh, to, 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 to employees working from home and, um, and also these, these regular catch-ups and, and, and they're more, a bit of fun and, 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 and the purpose is around that whole connection piece, bringing people together. Um, and, um, and, and, and we have, you know, uh, recently we had, um, for It's OK Day, um, we had a lot of support, a lot of barbecues on site um, um, and, and um, 
and we show a lot of support around around um, initiatives and days like that that come up regularly as well. So there's a few things on that, and that's something that um, ADCO are, are very big on in terms of um, you know, supporting um, um, health and well-being and 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 so forth. And the other one is probably just mates in construction um, is is a partner that we we um, utilise and 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 have toolbox talks with people on site quite regularly, whether it's on site or, or, or through Zoom meetings. So there's a lot of different areas there that, that we'll, we'll look at. But um, yeah, it's, if, um, that probably answers the question there, Neil. Yeah, it does, it does. Um, another audience question for you, Doug, and, and it goes to what you were saying a little bit earlier in uh, your approach to, if, if you're going to get into platforms, it's, it's all in. Um, so. Process. How did ADCO get buy-in from internal and external stakeholders in regards to tech adoption and, and tech utilisation? Yeah, so I think the entry point is always you've got to look at your driver. And I think the obvious ones are always, it used to cost $1,000, we can do it for $500. So there's that whole, the commercial side, but whether it's a cost thing, whether it's an efficiency thing that used to take us one week, we can do it in three days. Um, there's a whole regulation piece, which is our client are asking us to do it, or it might be for a particular reason. It might be um, um, that, 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 that um, we have to do it. And, and some of those might come from Green Star, from Indigenous participations on projects. It might come from, so there might be from, from a regulation point of view, um, reasons to do it. But the biggest one there is probably just the, what's in it for me in terms of what, 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 what our stakeholders can, will, will, will get out of that change. And, uh, the best way I put that is, is, is optioning it out, looking at our current position and then looking at what options are available. Um, and there's always that do nothing option and, and, um, and, and, and there's pros and cons to each. There's always going to be a cost to each. Um, but then it's about presenting that and, and getting some alignment. So it's, it's, it's telling that story. Um, Neil, as opposed to just sort of saying this is what we're doing, it's about um, that communication piece, optioning things out. You've got that do nothing option and, um, and, and, and looking for that driver, that reason why, but, um, um, and they're, they're probably the answers. Thanks, Doug. Um, and one more for you, again, from the audience. Um, and there's another question, so I'm gonna, it's very similar, I'm gonna put them together. Are you looking at utilizing collaboration tools more broadly to cater for the new world that we're in? Um, and you know, what, what are your plans for the future? What other innovative solutions are you doing at this point? Yeah, so I think at ADCO, the last couple of years has always been around um, digitising. How do we get, how to bring those applications, those workflows, replace those legacy processes, get us off the paper and pen and get us more into the iPads, the laptops and, 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 and more digital trans, um, more digital um, processes to sort of pick up those efficiency gains. Um, what are we doing after that? I think the next, the next phase for us is more on the data piece. I think with ADCO, we have um, something we call a, a, a data foundation layer or a consolidation, which is where we pull data sets from each of these applications and we consolidate. And the reason why we do that is we report. So we report on safety, we report on um, our project performance, and we have our, 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 our PCRs coming through there as well. And, and, and so for us, the next stage is that whole data piece. And, um, and um, we have partnerships with, with, with different universities as well. And, and, and we're looking into things around big data, analytics, AI, um, looking at how we could sort of um, um, get, get better utilise it. And um, some other things there as well around um, augmented reality. We've, we've trialled, um, we've, we've, we've modelled out um, a, a fair few projects now from, from looking at new ways to, to, to show what, what, what um, finished buildings can look like. And that can help from, um, um, from a client's perspective or from a safety perspective and that sort of thing. So. So to answer that question is, is for us, our, our focus and our energy um, will we'll, we'll, we'll transition more into that data piece and how can we better better provide and better empower our project team to make better decisions is, 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 our, is, our, is our goal. Thanks, Doug. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left and I do have one final question for you before we finish. And it is, what were the keys to success for ADCO to implement tech throughout their business? The keys, the keys to success, um, it was basically looking at what we were setting out to achieve. So, for instance, um, if, if, if we're looking at um, 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 RFIs, for instance, we, we, we're looking at more transparency, better reporting on, 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 on RFIs, how we, can, how we can consolidate on RFIs, and looking at what we're setting out to achieve, whether it's from um, a, a cost-saving perspective, an efficiency gain, 
whether it's from more transparency, um, better reporting. So it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a project in a sense in terms of um, what are our objectives, we deliver, and then, and then, and then we look back to see whether we, um, whether, whether, whether we have the, um, um, the outcomes that we, we, we set out to achieve. So, um, and, and I think the other one is just that cultural shift, I think, as well. I think as, as, as we start to transition and as we start to relocate these, these legacy processes into digital, we're starting to notice a cultural change within the business, um, and and and, and uh, we're noticing that employees are starting to to, to embrace it. They're starting to to work different ways, and 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 um, and, and and that's also helped from a change management point of view as well. So to answer that one is is, is looking at what we're setting out to achieve to start off with, and did we achieve that? Mm. The, the the other one is around that cultural change as as, as well, um, and 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 that in itself complements that whole change management piece as well. So um, there's a few things there, but um, 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 that, that probably answers that one. Neil. It does indeed, and thanks again, Doug. So that's us for today. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks to the audience and uh, thanks both Doug, thank you, Ivan, um, and thank you both for sharing your insights with us. Um, there's a pop-up on your screen now and uh, we'd appreciate you filling it in so we can get your feedback in the session. Once again, thanks to everyone involved.